Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Stock Talk, where we dive deep into the latest trends and insights in the world of investing. I'm Evelyn John, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. We are thrilled to have you join us as we explore a topic that's been making waves in the financial sector of Sri Lanka, understanding the surge in banking earnings. In today's episode, we'll be tackling this topic in two engaging parts. Part one will feature a comprehensive presentation where we'll break down the key factors driving the recent increase in banking earnings. Our expert will guide us through the numbers, trends, and underlying causes that have led to this exciting development. I would like to request our audience to post your questions in the chat box during the presentation, and we'll take it up during the Q&A session. To conduct the presentation, we have Mr. Ranjan Ranathunga joining us today. Ranjan has over eight years of experience in both local and foreign equity markets. Prior to working in Sri Lankan equity markets, Ranjan worked as a senior analyst catering to both buy-side and sell-side funds in US and UK. Ranjan holds a bachelor's degree from Staffordshire University of UK and holds AZMA and CGMA qualifications. Following the presentation, we'll move into part two, which will be our interactive Q&A session. Mr. Rasika Vidhanalage will be joining along with Ranjan for the Q&A. Rasika has extensive experience of over 20 years in banking, finance, and capital markets. He is currently the vice president at First Capital Equities Private Limited. His previous roles include chief operating officer at Capital Trust Mobility Solutions, CEO at Capital Trust Automobile and Senior Management Positions at Capital Trust Securities. He also has experience with the London Stock Exchange and HSBC Sri Lanka. Rasika is an associate member of SIMA UK, holds a double major in marketing and management from Northwood University and an MBA from the University of West London. He is a registered investment advisor in Sri Lanka and is pursuing a PhD in capital markets at NSBM Green University. So without further ado, let's dive into part one of our session. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ranjan Ranthunga, who will lead us through the analysis of the surge in banking earnings. Over to you, Ranjan. Right. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, so I hope my screen is visible to everyone. So uh, first of all, let me welcome all of you and uh, thank you for taking uh, the precious time of your busy schedules to join the second edition of the Stock Talk, where we'll be taking you all through the fundamental changes that has happened in the banking sector, as well as why we think the banking sector is the sector to be in. So, uh, uh, as uh, Evelyn explained, uh, I will be taking you all through a small presentation of uh, to understand how the banking sector profitability and the fundamentals have behaved during the concern period, uh, followed by a, a, a Q and A, which of course uh, feel free to uh, join in from there. So uh, to take you all through the banking sector, see. So in terms of banking sector. Uh, so we have, if you have been following uh, first capital research, we have picked, uh, we picked banking sector uh, during last October, uh, and uh, with that we have uh, we have uh, identified banking sector as one of the strongest uh, performing sectors in the next twelve months. So in line with our profit uh, expectations, the profitability has improved on the banking sector. Uh, uh, in terms of sector, we are identified here the. The, uh, the top six companies, which includes commercial, HNB, Sampat, NDB, Seran, and NTB. So in terms of this uh, banking sector, uh, the profitability has improved by 99.4% during the second quarter. While if you look at the first half figures, the banking sector has performed and grown by 73% uh, on a EOA basis during the first half. And if you look at the individual banks as well on the right-hand side chart, we have seen that all the banks, which has been highlighted by the darker shade of blue, uh, is a, uh, the latest first half result. And if you see across the board, we have seen the uh, profitability surging uh, rapidly across the board on all banks under our coverage. 
So uh, looking at the uh, bank set profitability, uh, so uh, the growth in the bank profitability has been mainly driven by the, the growth in the core business. So in terms of core business, it is interesting to look at how the NIEIs in the banking sector has performed. And uh, we believe this is uh, this is one of the key reasons for the banking sector profitability re-rating that we have seen as well. So in terms of net interest income, we have seen uh, all banks perform uh, really well in terms of net interest income, mainly due to the uh, the proactive approach of the banks where they have uh, they have proactively reduced the uh, deposit cost uh, with the uh, with the re uh, readjusting of uh, deposit uh, uh, deposit rate. So with this, we have seen that uh, due to the with this, we have seen that. Uh, banks performing uh, well in terms of net interest income, which which is shown on the chart on the left hand side, and uh, we, uh, on the right hand side we have the net interest margins, which is has also been one of the key factors that has been supporting the growth in the bank asset as well. So in terms of net interest margin, uh, you have to consider here uh, it is uh, uh, yeah, it is not advised to uh, check this on a year year basis because. Uh, net interest margins will depend uh, largely on the interest rates on the in, uh, interest rate environment of Sri Lanka. So, and uh, if you look at the last year, we have seen uh, net interest mar uh, interest levels being maintained at a relatively high level compared to the uh, single digit levels that we are experiencing right now. So uh, when you compare on a QOQ basis, we have seen uh, NIMS improve across the banking sector companies as well. Uh, we are, uh, yeah. And uh, apart from the net interest income growth that we have seen, uh, next biggest uh, contribution is coming from the provisions. So if you look at the provisions, uh, provisions for the second quarter totaled to 24 billion uh, from the 32 billion recorded in the second quarter of last year. Uh, if you look at why the provisions has been coming down, it has been contributed by a couple of factors. Uh, first thing, uh, if you have been following the banking sector, uh, you may already know that banking ex uh, sector has exposure to uh, international sovereign bonds, which is being discussed right now for restructuring. So, in an event where a haircut comes or a haircut comes on the either on the outstanding debt or on the outstanding interest payments, uh, the banking sector may have to absorb a uh, loss. So, because of this factor, uh, banks will proactively manage their uh, profitabilities by uh, provisioning high, by provisioning uh, close to about 50 to 55 percent of their exposure on sovereign bonds uh, so that in an event where a haircut comes in it won't be directly applicable and hit on the books because <coughs> as you may know banks are mostly in the business of managing deposits and uh, giving loans and it's the customer it's the public money that they're responsible for so to avoid that hit banks went on to provision uh, higher impairments uh, in order to cover up the uh, uh, potential loss that can arise from an haircut. On the second hand, as I mentioned to you, uh, there is obviously the uh, the higher moratoriums that were given out after the uh, after uh, several factors that affected the country from Easter bomb Easter bomb in 2018 and to COVID in 2019, uh, 2019 and 2020, and followed by the economic crisis, <laughs> where uh, most of the businesses are affected and. The government opted for moratoriums, which also uh, resulted with higher NPLs on the banking sector. But however, now, going forward, we have seen uh, impairment uh, coming down drastically, as well as uh, NPLs, which are showing signs of slowing down as well. So uh, a few things contributing to the slowdown is that we have seen tangible recovery happening on the ground level in Sri Lanka, where we have seen solid GDP growth. Uh, for almost three consecutive quarters, where uh, the first quarter growth has climbed on top of 5.3%. So these are very good numbers that are coming in from GDP side, which is trickling down to the low, the uh, separate segments of the in uh, separates of the economy as well, which is positively affecting uh, the recoveries of the banking sector. And also to mention, uh, if you may, uh, if you have been following us, if you look at the past figures. The one of the two sec biggest sectors that have been contributed to the N NPLs were the tourism and the construction sector. And we have seen very good recoveries in terms of these as well. We, are, we have seen tourism doing very well in terms of arrivals and profitabilities. While on the construction side, we have seen the resumption of uh, multilateral backed projects that have been happening again. So all these factors contributed uh, uh, is expected to reduce the NPLs uh, of the banking sector going forward. 
However, although say, we say that there's, there can be a slight reduction, uh, the reduction is expected to come towards the end of the year, where we are expecting uh, mainly uh, because of the uh, the lifting of the suspension that is there on the parat execution. So if you, uh, in terms of parat execution, you may already know uh, the banks, uh, so the government of Sri Lanka in the month of June decided to uh, suspend the uh, current parat execution system uh, for recoveries. So with this, uh, the banks have been uh, been challenged by the uh, the collections, uh, and we have also seen uh, loan book and the loan book and interest rates also slightly at a higher rate because of the uh, the parat execution, the suspension in the parat execution that we have seen. So, uh, however, we had to mention that we have uh, talked with most of the corporates, and they are signaling that uh, they are showing confident that <coughs> sorry, they are showing confident that the current existing parata execution uh, suspension can be lifted going forward as well, which we believe would possibly be trickled down in 20 years going forward. And uh, in, when you're comparing the, uh, when you're looking at the banking sector, it is also important to see uh, the loan book of the banking sector. So in terms of loan book at first capital, we are very optimistic on the banking sector loan book, where majority will be uh, driven through private sector credit. So in terms of private sector credit, we have two targets. That is one for this 7.5% uh, for this year, uh, followed by 10% for next year uh, in the for the next 12 months. Uh, so with that, uh, we have seen uh, banking sector loan groups also growing in line with the expectation that we have for private sector credit growth, that we have already seen the numbers turning in. So that's a, that's a growth that we have seen in the banks as well. We are because of the loan book is going into commercial bank because of the specific customer segment that they target that includes corporates. <clears throat> Sorry. And also, this loan book growth is also evident uh, in the uh, NTB loan books, where NTB also is specializes in uh, servicing a certain uh, uh, high margin customer base and a high uh, income customer base, where the uh, recovery we have seen already trickling down into. And when you're finally, when you're looking at the banks, it is also important to see how their stability is. In terms of when you're measuring stability, it is good to identify, there is two major ratios that we look at. One is the tier one capital and the other one is the total capital ratio. In terms of tier one, we have seen that all banks are above the regulatory requirement, which has been uh, highlighted by the dotted line that has been on red. However, if you look at certain banks in the spectrum, we have seen that uh, commercial bank and NDB have relatively thinner uh, buffers compared to other banks. In terms of commercial bank, they're currently having about 10.9% in terms of tier one capital compared to the regular requirement of 10% that they want. They're still above the threshold, but however, the buffer is very thin. And we have seen commercial bank coming out and doing a right issue followed by a debenture, which will uh, help commercial bank to cost, uh, further strengthen the buffers that they already have on the tier one capital. In terms of, uh, uh, however, uh, on the other side, we have NDB, which is also having a slightly thinner buffer compared to other banks, but we have not seen an announcement or right issue or something like that coming in to strengthen the total tier one capital as well. However, uh, we had to be a little bit cautious when you're looking at tier one capital in terms of NDB. In terms of total capital ratio, we have seen, again, we have seen very good levels with slightly thinner buffers in commercial bank, which is expected to strengthen as uh, they inc uh, they uh, successfully completes the right issue followed by the dimension. So uh, with that being highlighted, uh, we don't see speci any specific uh, other risks coming into banking sector apart from the uh, potential capital requirements that they will face. In terms of valuation, as I mentioned, uh, we are very much bullish on the banking sector, mainly due to the uh, very attractive uh, valuations that it has. So in terms of valuation, we have seen banks trading almost at 0.5 times, uh, 5, 0.5 times uh, while, <coughs> sorry, 0.5 times, while also uh, giving almost an upside of 81% to our target price. And to note that uh, we have seen prices of uh, banks come down from the prices identified here. For instance, uh, we have seen commercial bank coming into the 80 price levels from the 93 levels that we highlighted, while uh, HNB has also come down slightly. So if you look at the banking sector again, I just want to read it here. The banks have been trading at a very, very cheap multiples. And we believe that 
uh, banks are a question, uh, a place to be for your investments in the next uh, 12, 12 months as well. Uh, just to highlight uh, why we are on the banking sector. So banking sector, uh, as we mentioned, banks are having, uh, given that banks are a proxy to the economy, uh, that believes, uh, that means that, uh, that all the bank, all the economic activities are flowing through the banks. So because of this, once the GDP recovers, we will see the core business of the banking, uh, the banks also jumping as well. Apart from this, uh, we have the ADR currently in negotiation and we have bit of, received a bit of clarity on that front as well. And with the completion of ADR and with the possible credit rating upgrade, we are expecting banking set to re-rate as well. So those are a few of the catalysts why we are expecting banks to be the next uh, big thing in the stock market as well. So with this, I believe that I have taken out through uh, the uh, fairly good amount of fundamentals. And uh, with this, I will give the mic to uh, Evelyn again to take you all through the next of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjan, for taking us through such an insightful presentation. A gentle reminder to our audience to send in your questions through the Q&A chat box. Let me ask the first question from Rasika. Rasika, the banking sector has played a significant role within the index and our earlier forecasts about its performance post-domestic debt restructure have proven to be quite accurate. Looking ahead, what should we anticipate as the next steps for the banking sector, especially with upcoming elections and the pending external debt restructure? Additionally, how might these factors influence investor perceptions and stock selection within the sector? Thank you, Evelyn. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me thank all of you all for joining with us today for the Stock Talk episode number two. Well, I would like to start from where I ended last time with the topic, why should you invest in the stock market now? Where I did a clip during the last uh, last uh, last year, latter part of uh, 2023. During that time, when the domestic debt restructuring had become a critical topic in the market, with the feedback that we have received and when comparing with the actual outcome, certainly we all know that was very useful for many of our investors. Yet again, today we are meeting at a very critical time where we are just 10 days away from the upcoming presidential election. However, overall market sentiment appears to be quite negative and already has come down by about 2,000 points from 2,500 up to 10,600 levels. As a percentage, all share price index has come down slightly about 16% from the recent peak levels of 12,500, what we experienced during May 2024. When considering the overall market correction or the decline, banking sector can be considered as one of the key sectors that has been affected significantly with the market correction. Now, the question is, as an investor, what do we do? Let me answer this question this way. What are the other asset classes that we associate in our normal life? For an example, land and property, vehicles, gold, silver, Generally, what do we do when you see an absolute bargain on any of these asset classes? Think about it for a moment. At least you will consider looking at it. Now, let's look at our banking sector, some of the prices. HNB has come down from about 210 to 154. Commercial has come down from 115 to 80. NDB has come down from 84 to 62. DFCC has come down from 84 to 65. Sampath has come down from 84 to 68. NTB has come down from 135 to 104. Well, all we need to remember is that equity is also yet another asset class where you should consider bargains depending on your affordability and your own risk appetite, which suits you. Consider the value of each banking sector stock. 
based on the fundamental guidelines that we have provided. And also, as an investor, you should frequently go through the banking sector official corporate disclosures, which are already published. Try, try and identify the ones which has specifically uh, related to possible corporate actions, such as mergers, acquisitions, where as an investor, you might get a competitive advantage over such scenarios. Once you do that, I am sure as an investor, you will be in a much, much better position to make a well-informed investment decision related to Sri Lankan banking sector. Ranjan, would you like to add some numbers to this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Rasi. Yeah. Uh, as Rasika mentioned, uh, the banking sector as well as the stock market currently is at a uh, very much discounted price. And as he explained, we have we saw the uh, bank, uh, the stock market hitting a peak of twelve thousand five hundred in May, and right now the market has fallen by about fifteen percent. And as Rasika mentioned again, uh, the banking stocks has come down drastically compared to and is offering about a twenty five percent discount from the peak it was at. So in a situation like this, we believe that the fundamentals of the banking sector is supporting the growth, but however. Uh, one thing that we had to mention is that uh, uh, that these prices, we are, first of all, uh, you have to identify uh, one thing is why the banking sector has been trading at these prices. For example, if you look at from 2018 onwards, the banking sector has been under continuous stress. For example, from the uh, Easter bomb attack, followed by the COVID pandemic and followed by the uh, economic crisis, where the banking sector was impacted through high NPLs and uh, moratoriums. So all these factors contributed towards the uh, reason why the banking sector was uh, looked, uh, uh, looked away by the investors compared to other shares. But now the uh, but now the banking sector is gathering steam. We have seen solid growth in profitability that's coming and the growth was mainly driven by the core business uh, without rather than uh, what were ad hoc items or one-off items. So this core business, we expect it to continue forward as well as economy recovers. And that is why we believe while the fundamental supporting without the external volatility that we are seeing on the share prices, it is good that uh, it is uh, why it is uh, important to take positions at these undervalued prices. Because as Rasika mentioned, we are, the market doesn't offer these prices for a long time. These prices comes then when there's risk attached. But what we had to consider, as Rasika mentioned, is how you manage the risk. And it is, uh, it is this. Uh, so there's a saying on the market saying that you have to, uh, you have to be, a, you have to uh, get into shares when there's blood on the streets. So when the market is on red, and when offering the prices are offered at dirt cheap prices, you have to pounce on it to take advantage of this. So that is why we think that given that there has been a massive drop in prices on across the banking sector shares. Uh, while on the other side, the fundamentals are improving. That's why we believe that it is time to pounce on the banking sector shares in order to maximize the returns in the coming months as well. Thank you very much, Rasika and uh, Ranjan, for shedding some light in terms of how uh, the external debt restructure can have an impact on the banking sector. Uh, let me ask this uh, question from Ranjan. When the earnings of banking sector are rising, why the stock prices are decreasing? Yeah, so uh, so Evelyn, to answer this, I think uh, 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 what is important to understand, I think the, the question has been directed very well because we have seen, obviously we have seen the banking set profitability improving continuously. However, the prices have been coming down steadily. Uh, the reason for this is the political uncertainty in the picture market. So for uh, when you're talking about political uncertainty, the banking sector is slightly uh, affected, uh, more so relatively higher, uh, more affected compared to other stocks in the equity market because of the fact that the banks have, as I mentioned before, has exposure to uh, international sovereign bonds, uh, which is being discussed uh, right now for restructuring. So if you have been following this topic, uh, uh, there was uh, the latest development in, uh, in terms of the EDR negotiations came in... Uh, uh, the month of Ju July, where the uh, the uh, president of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranil Kumar Singh, uh, came forward and announced that uh, 
Sri Lanka has uh, completed uh, EDR uh, with the private uh, with the private bondholders, and they are waiting for the IMF approval. So, in terms of the approval, we have uh, the 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 agreement is in uh, there that so that uh, uh, there is a twenty eight percent haircut on the outstanding debt, while another fifteen percent haircut is there on the outstanding interest payments. So, because of this factor, the banking sector profitabilities. Uh, on the fence because uh, not, not the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with the upcoming elections, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, political noise surrounding the IMF agreements. So because of this factor, we have seen. Uh, banks falling, uh, although their profitability has been increasing. And if you look at the other companies as well on the equities market, we have seen, for, for example, in terms of uh, the corporate earnings that they have posted for the uh, the second quarter of this year, that is the uh, June ended quarter, we have already seen uh, the corporate profit, listed corporate profitability going up by about 119%. So this is a very good growth. And also note that this is a double profit that we have seen. So all the uh, fundamentals are supporting growth. And we have seen, uh, for example, we are, in terms of other fundamental reasons, we have seen interest rates uh, maintained at single digit levels. While uh, the inflation continues to hover around uh, below the 5% mark. While we have seen solid growth in terms of uh, reserve collection as well as other economic indicators as well. So all the other factors are fundamentally supporting the equity market as well as the equity investments. However, the political uncertainty in the market is the only thing that has been driving down the uh, prices of share prices uh, as as I highlighted. I hope I uh, explained that question everything. Yes, Ranjan, thank you very much. Rasika, I would like to present this question to you. Given the recent uh, market volatility and the challenges of navigating such an environment, identifying optimal pricing points has proven difficult. From your perspective, when markets are volatile and investor sentiment is especially uncertain, how do you develop a pricing model that aligns with your expectations and strategies? Well, uh, Evelyn, volatility is one of the key features of a free market, where market will react independently for the external factors, such as, uh, you know, such external factors could be either positive or negative. But the most important thing is that this type of volatilities create clear opportunities for all the investors. Always remember, when we do a transaction, there are two parties involved. One will sell, one will buy. And there's only one winner with the price movement. Either price will go up or come down. Therefore, when considering the uh, transactions, you need to be very careful and you need to utilize all the available information to take an investment decision. Now, if you look at, uh, now, since we are considering a model, if you look at the overall status of our current banking sector, as my colleague Ranjan just mentioned, P ratios are roughly around four times. Price to book values are around 0.4 times. And also, the dividend yields are about 5%. Now, in an uncertain environment, obviously, this looks quite attractive. Uncertain environment with the presidential outcome, if you really want to deep dive into a kind of a model to justify your investment decision, you can go to the extent to develop a simple expected value computation, assigning probabilities as you wish for the outcome, and also the expected return for the each scenario to arrive on an investment decision quite methodically with your own justification, with your own beliefs. When you do that type of calculation by yourself, employing the probabilities that you believe, then you might realize that simply you don't have to react blindly or hearsay to the prevailing adverse situations. That will essentially justify your investment decision without just uh, doing things ad hoc. -y. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rasika, for giving us some clarification in that area. Let me present this question to Ranjan. 
What are the main factors we need to consider to pick a banking stock among others? Yes, thank you, Evelyn. I think that's a very good question because uh, uh, right now this, this must be a very uh, uh, big problem for investors on selecting what is the best bank in the banking sector. So when you're looking at banks, there are a few factors to look at. Uh, so when you're looking at a bank, either you have to go for a bank that is growing faster than the others or the bank which will give you a, a higher return in terms of the prices, uh, trading prices. Or, uh, or you have to go for a bank that has very low exposure to the current uncertainties in the market. So these are, I believe these are the three strategies should you should look at. For instance, uh, if you look at profitability, I think uh, uh, the fastest in terms of profit uh, is commercial bank. This is because commercial bank addresses a part of the society where they are catering to the big corporates, where we have seen the recovery hitting first in terms of GDP. So uh, if you look at the big corporates, we have seen the profitability of big corporates surging very much higher compared to the, the smaller parts, like the SMEs as well as the micro companies. Uh, and this has been evident and this has been, been proved by the uh, profitability that we have seen in the listed corporates as well. So if you, target, if you want to target profitability for a higher, faster growth uh, company, uh, the obvious choice is commercial bank because commercial bank lends to the, the, the big corporates where the current loan growth is currently trending from. While there is also another company that is the Nations Trust Bank, which will also cater, which is which is also catered to the high income uh, category of the society as well. So as I mentioned before, so these are the sectors that has shown resilient growth and has has shown uh, already shown fast and high uh, uh, faster than uh, average loan growth in terms to compared to sector as well. Uh, but however, we had to also mention uh, in terms of uh, profitability. We have only seen the big corporates taking out loans so far. Uh, and we have not seen the smaller SMEs as well as retail taking out loans. But as the GDP continues on its recovery trajectory, we may see the, the benefits of the economic recovery uh, trickling down to the smaller parts of the uh, segments of the economy as well. So which will prompt loan growth uh, as well. So. When the when the the benefits started to trickle down to the smaller parts of the economy, we may see Sampath Bank, HNB, Panasia's, and other other banks, uh, even Ceylon, NDB, all of them benefiting once uh once that segment of their corporate loan book get unlocked. So right now we are only seeing uh growth in terms of loan coming into the big corporates, while the slow the smaller companies are yet to see loan growth. So. If we are looking at right now, I think what we need to target is uh, commercial bank and NTB, which is already showing promising growth right now. While if you want to uh, uh, get in at a slightly discounted price uh, compared to the big corporates, we, we, there's opportunity in Sampath, uh, HNB, Ceylon, likewise as well. But uh, at, so that's the first pillar I was talking about. The second pillar is stability. So why we uh, select, why we check on stability is because when, as I showed you earlier, when it comes to stability, we look at tier one and tier two capital. So tier one and two, tier two capital indicates how stable the bank is and how, how much buffers the bank currently has compared to its regular requirement. So why we look at this is when the buffers are thinning out and when the current uh, capital component is coming near the regulated uh, requirement capital, the banks will tend to go for right issue or private placement to bump up the uh, current capital. So that will result in dilution of the ownership if you are currently having any banks, which will prompt uh, further funding in order to maintain the same uh, level of exposure as the same level of uh, ownership that you had in a company. So that is why it is interesting to look at uh, how stable the banks are. And if you look at uh, right now under the current scenario, as I mentioned to you, we have two banks, which is near near the, their uh, capital buffers. One is the commercial bank. The second is NDB. In terms of commercial bank, we have already seen commercial bank announcing rights and debentures to, uh, to uh, pump up the existing buffers they have. 
while NDP, we are yet to hear of a right issue or something that is uh, that is there on the cards in the coming months as well. So uh, in terms of stability, I'll suggest to uh, take positions in companies that are uh, has a somewhat of a strong buffer compared to thinner buffers of commercial bank and uh, in, uh, NDB. And finally, in terms of valuations, so valuations also acts as a key part when you're considering your investment because uh, depends on how much the market is offering or trading at a discount. So if you look at the current multiples, we have seen commercial uh, commercial bank trading at 0.5 times, while we have seen uh, 0.6 times, while HNB is trading slightly below 0.5 times, while we have other banks like Pan Asia, NDB, all trading below 0.5 times. So uh, it is all, so that is why because when uh, the story that we are saying is uh, attached to the valuations because uh, what we have seen in the past is as soon as the banks uh, are always across the 15% threshold, we have seen banks re-rating in terms of uh, close to one times book value as well. So uh, given that, uh, so right now what we our expectation is that we believe the current big banks like Commercial, uh, Sampath uh, and HNB uh, possibly re rate to one times in the near future. While uh, on the other side, we have the small, relatively smaller banks that include Ceylan, Sampath and Indi, uh, Ceylan, uh, Panasia and NDB. While on the other side, we have DFCC also. These three range to about 0.8 times as ROEs catch up, compare, catch up to the levels that big banks are having. So uh, these are a few of the factors that you would consider when you are deciding on what come banks to buy out of the uh, out of the. Uh, spectrum of banks that we have in the listed in the corporate exchange. I hope that answered the question, Nervin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjan, for answering that question. And let me present this question to Rasika. Could you provide examples of uh, instances where investors, driven by a rational understanding of potential future upside, took a contrarian approach and achieved exponential returns by investing against the prevailing market sentiment? Well, uh... If you look at most of the well-known international success stories, uh, investors such as Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Robert Kiyosaki, they have always invested with volatility, uncertainty, and turbulence. In fact, some of them will wait for such turbulent environment to buy their preferred asset classes at bargain prices. For an example, Robert Kiyosaki once said he made most of his money during year 2008 subprime mortgage crisis where he collected large amount of property at absolute bargain price levels since there were only few buyers available at that time. So essentially what we need to understand is crisis means a wealth transition from one to another. Important is which side of the problem that you want to be in such situation depending on each investor's risk appetite and the tolerance levels, you may decide which side that you would like to stay. Now, uh, if you look at the last two and a half decades in Sri Lanka, let's look at some of the scenarios where we have experienced the volatility that we have encountered. Now, for example, starting from tsunami, LTT attacks, then the East attack, COVID pandemic, Sri Lanka sovereign bond default. Think for a moment and see who has succeeded in these turbulent times whether the investors who sold their portfolios during a turbulence or the investors who have bought and invest wisely during a turbulent period. That's something that I would like you all to think. And finally, when considering the prevailing situation and the upcoming presidential election, all what we need to understand that all three main parties consist of Sri Lankans. And all of them already put forward their political manifestos and clearly emphasize on the importance of capital markets and how each political party seriously going to look at the capital market in order to specifically to get foreign direct investments to the country. In, in, in conclusion, whoever the political party comes to power, that they will come to power through the democratic procedure with people mandate. Therefore, I strongly believe that all of us should respect that and take our investment decisions quite wisely 
in order to maximize our returns while managing the risk. That will certainly lead to a better capital market future in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Rasika. Um, there is uh, there are three questions covering uh, Bangladesh and the Maldives crisis. So let me present it to Ranjan. Ranjan, uh, what could be the potential losses to commercial bank arising from lending into the Maldives uh, and Bangladesh? And uh, what impact does this situation in Bangladesh and Maldives have on the banking sector, especially to commercial bank, since they are exposed to Bangladesh? Right. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, another good question that we are having because uh, we are seeing a lot of turbulent uh, turbulence in the uh, global markets right now where uh, Bangladesh as well as Maldives is currently uh, going through uh, something that we have seen happening in Sri Lanka as well. For example, if we uh, if say that uh, we are seeing in terms of uh, reserves, uh, reserves in terms of countries reserve position, we are seeing uh, bang both Bangladesh reserves and uh, Maldives reserves fall into uh, fall into very low levels, adding pressure into exchange rates and inflation and such. And we have seen uh, inflation also almost at double digit levels uh, across both these countries. So these are things that we have gone through in Sri Lanka as well. So if uh, so what I want, uh, what I'm thinking is right now, so if uh, given that we came through the same problem, we had a lot of issues on the banking sector uh, as well. For example, uh, the banks had a challenging period with the NPLs. While there was a period, uh, so to uh, combat the high inflation, the central bank had to interest, uh, increase rates. So with the increase in rates, we saw loan books also coming down. And uh, with the rates increasing, we saw NPLs also rising because a lot of people went on default. So these are a few other factors that can affect the banking sector. Uh, but however, uh, something to note is that uh, when you're looking at commercial bank, uh, in terms of the asset basis, uh, the exposure to Bangladesh as well as small dips in terms of commercial bank is very low uh, compared to uh, the uh, asset size that is exposed to Sri Lanka compared to asset sizes those exposed to the two countries, it is very low. So uh, compare, so given that uh, Bangladesh is going through the same situation, the mall is going through the same situation, there can be somewhat of an impact coming into the, uh, the profitability of the banks. But I don't think this is something to be uh, worried of because uh, of the lower exposure it has to both Maldives and uh, uh, Bangladesh compared to the exposure it has in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Ranjan. With the interest of time, we will have to wrap up our session today. If you have further questions, uh, we will keep the meeting open for the next five minutes. Please feel free to send them through the chat box along with your email ID. We will write back to you. Thank you all for joining us today for Stock Talk Episode 2. A special thanks to our insightful panelists for sharing their exp expertise and perspectives on the surge in banking earnings. To our audience, we appreciate your engagement and thoughtful questions. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, with us by following our social media pages. We'll be sharing updates and details about Stock Talk Episode 3 soon. We look forward to having you with us again. Thank you and have a great evening.